our next speaker is Todd Lane. Um, Todd is Associate, Pre Associate Professor at the Uni of Melbourne and the Deputy Director of the ARC Centre for Excellence for Climate Extremes. And he's going to talk about some of the mesoscale features, in particular the bores and rolls, the key mesoscale phenomenon in Black Saturday. Thank you, Todd. Thanks, Mika. Put myself up. Uh, thanks, everyone, and thanks for the inv invitation to speak here today. Uh, like Michael, this has been work has been done as part of a, a, a team, quite a, quite a large team. We were fortunate enough to receive um, funding from the ARC, ARC under the Discovery Program over two projects um, that ran shortly after Black Saturday through to last year or the year before. Um, I wouldn't mind just taking a, a second to acknowledge the victims, survivors and um, those involved in operations on the day um, for Black Saturday. It was a, certainly a tragic event. And it's, um, you can see today and the other research that's gone on uh, that, that, that we have learnt a lot from this event about meteorology operations and communications. And so hopefully that will mitigate future disasters like this one. Um, much, most of the work I'm talking about today uh, is found in this paper that was led by Chanel Engel. Uh, this came out uh, in 2013. Uh, and uh, some of the work that Michael was talking about is from this paper as well. So the outline of my talk today, um, what I'm really going to be focusing on is some high resolution model simulations. So, so like a high resolution weather forecast model of the meteorology of 7th of February 2009. And I'll focus on some of the mesoscale features, the, the boundary layer rolls that happened during the day, uh, the passage of the, the cool change and then a nocturnal bore. And now a couple of these were mentioned earlier today by Graham and Andrew among others. Um, and then I'll finish up with a summary and some, some challenges in using these models and, and what the future holds, I think. So here's our, our model simulation. And this is using the, the UK Met Office model, which is essentially the access model, which is the operational weather prediction model for Australia. And at the time of Black Saturday, uh, this model wasn't operational. Um, but what we did after the event, we ran this simulation, and we used essentially what, what was the first access operational setup uh, for this simulation, except we nested down to these very high resolution nests. And so our highest resolution nest here is at 440 metre horizontal grid spacing. After that, Michael showed some of this work, we went down to 150 metre grid spacing as well. So we've got observations and uh, model profiles from Robin Airport, which I'll show in a few minutes. But what I, what I wanted to show was this map, and we've seen this map before, and most people in the room are familiar with it. Um, there are a large number of fires over this part of central Victoria, and that's really the focus of our, our, uh, our model domain, that large region of Victoria, extending to the north uh, to this Beechworth fire. And I'll talk about the Beechworth fire a little bit later as well. So here's the trace, um, automatic weather station trace from Moravian Airport. Uh, the observations are in light grey here, and the model simulations are in black. Let's focus on the observations first. And you can see our, our temperature, our very high temperatures on the day, um, and very strong gusty, gusty winds. And so this noisiness is the gustiness of the winds. Uh, you can see from the model that we reproduce the black line that reproduces the maximum temperature on the day very well. We have this error in the timing of the cool change, which Graham talked about too. Uh, in the wind speed, we see that lull in the wind speed and then the pickup with the second cool change, or the, the synoptic front coming through later in the evening as well that Graham mentioned. Now what you see here in the gustiness of the winds, in this model, this 400 metre grid spacing model, which is a, a very high resolution forecast, it isn't actually reproducing the gustiness of the winds on the day particularly well. And what we found was once we went down to 100 metre grid spacing, we got a much better representation of 
like that class signals, which I think is quite important. So there'll be three, three periods that I'll, I'll focus on. Uh, the daytime mixing, so this gustiness during the day, what are the processes leading to that gustiness of the wind? Um, the cool change or the coastal front that came in in the late afternoon, early evening. And then this second change uh, later in the evening as well, uh, which is linked to the develop development of an undulate bore inland. So let's look first at the daytime mixing. And so this is from the model simulation, and what I'm showing on the left here is the wind speed. And this is not at the surface, this is uh, at 500 metres, so just above the surface. Some locations in here to help you orient, it, orient yourself. Melbourne, the circle, Mrabin, the X, Marysville, marked here. And on the left we've got the wind speed and the direction. And what you can see is there's a lot of structure in this wind. And this is just a, a single time snapshot at one o'clock in the afternoon. But what you can see is there's a lot of spatial variability to the wind. The winds are very strong as well. If we look at the vertical velocity, so the upward motion. So the wind isn't just going horizontal, it's going upwards. And you can see these bands, these bands of upward motion. And these bands are linked to the spatial variability in the wind. Now these are things that we've known about in the atmosphere in the boundary layer for, for quite a long time. These are called horizontal convective rolls. And so the air is flowing and essentially spiralling as it goes downstream, upwards and downwards. And producing these, these streaks of strong surface wind as well as parallel streaks of slightly weaker surface wind. Now these um, rolls had a spacing in our simulation of about 10 to 15 kilometres. And then when we went and looked at this satellite image, which many of you have seen before, um, in the satellite image you can see the, the smoke plumes from the active fires, and this is at uh, almost three o'clock in the afternoon, this image. Or you can see these clouds are actually organised into what are called cloud streets. And so these, this organisation is caused by those rolls in the boundary layer. So the spiralling wind in the boundary layer is causing this organisation of clouds. So that, this actually gave us some um, evidence that what the model was doing was, was close to um, reality or, or was, was realistic. What we also did um, was we calculated the spatial pattern of the FFDI. And I know this goes beyond the, the design capabilities of, of what we should be using FFDI for, but this was actually quite a useful exercise. We calculated the FFDI from the instantaneous images from the numerical weather prediction model. And what you could see is that there's an imprint of those convective rolls on that measure of fire danger. And most of that imprint, that modulation, comes from the wind. It's not, it's not coming from the temperature, it's not coming th from the relative humidity, it's coming from the wind speed. And, and so it's really those spirals in the wind that are creating these localised regions of enhanced fire danger closer to regions of slightly reduced fire danger. And there's also a lot of structure in the terrain as well because we do have complicated flow in the terrain. Okay, I've got a, an animation here showing the passage of the cool change from this model. So what's shaded here is the potential temperature and the wind, wind vectors. This is also at 500 metres, so it's above the ground, it's not the surface values. But what you can see, as I step this forward, the complexity of the cool change and um, the variability of the winds. So we've got our northerlies or northwesterlies before the cool change. Here's the, the southwesterly change coming through. Along the edge of the cool air, you see a lot of variability in the winds. They're shifting around in all sorts of directions, changes in speed to The cool air is funneled around the terrain as well, so you start to see this complicated structure to the cool change. The cool change is not a straight line that comes through. Uh, you see this cool air being funneled around up Gippsland through there. Um, and moving its way up the valleys before going over the mountains. What's emerged right at the end of this, and I'd like to point this out, and I'll just step this back a little bit. 
as you see the synoptic front moving through in northern Victoria, what emerges is this little line right up the top, just here. This little line that moves ahead of the front. And that little line is what's called an undular ball. And it's actually separated from the synoptic front, moved just ahead of the cold front, and that's a small scale mesoscale feature. I'll go forward. So I'll get back to the undular ball in a minute. So here's the passage of the cool change. Looking at a cross section, here's the cool change there. Through Melbourne, we're just doing a cross section across the cool air and at two different times. And here's the, the red is the hot air and the blue is the cool air that's moving in along the ground. There's this little shallow tongue of cool air that moves, and that's how the, the cool change is moving through. And this is called a density current or a gravity current. So it's essentially what happens if you have your, your fridge door and you open your fridge door and the cool air flows out of your fridge and flows along the, the floor of your kitchen. Right? And that's basically what's happening when this cool air is, um, is coming in with the cool change. So it's very shallow. It's only a kilometre or so deep. The air flows up and over this cool change and you get a lot of structure in the, in the cool air and a lot of mixing of momentum and dry air actually coming down behind the cool change. And so if you look closely at the passage of the cool change, there's actually a band of gusty wind just behind it, and that's related to the, the mixing behind the, the head of the cool air. Right, this is getting back to the nocturnal bore that I showed you earlier. And just look at this image again, you can really see this how this cool air is funneled through the valleys and around the terrain, which I think is really dramatic. But looking up at Yarrawonga, right, here's our synoptic front. We've got that line that just emerged ahead of the front. If we look at the vertical velocity, the upward motion, you see this is really a sharp line that's emerged in the model. And this structure, a very fine scale structure, is an undular ball. A cross section through this line here, across Yarrawonga, this is what you can see. And the, now this is not as easy to see because these are line plots, but the, the grey shading is the potential temperature. And you can see that all this air is bunched together ahead of this undular bore, goes up and then it undulates. Right? So it's a jump in the airflow. See it here again. And you see these undulations, these ripples. This is essentially a wave in the atmosphere that is propagating along the surface, propagating along that surface inversion, that nocturnal inversion, which has started to form because we're now at 10 o'clock at night. There's upward flow and downward flow after that, so there's going to be upward motion, lofting, and descent and mixing and invigoration of things that are going on, and gustiness near the surface. Now let's look at the radar. This is the radar from Yarrawonga on the day. And here is the Beechworth fire. And you can see the plume from the Beechworth fire here. This line is this undular bore, this wave, this ripple in the atmosphere that is propagating ahead of the cool change. Let's step forward in time. Go, go, here we go. Here's our undular bore moving. Just going to pause it for a second, if I can, if I can work out how to use a computer. Look at the plume, the smoke plume. It's just dark blue, all right? And it's dark blue, continues to be dark blue. And this ball moves through, moves across the Beechworth fire, and as soon as it does, that plume changes colour. There's an invigoration of the plume, which is indicative and suggest suggestive of invigoration of the fire. And you can see that the plume really has been invigorated as that undular ball moved through. Okay, so this is pretty, pretty good evidence that that undular ball really interacted with that fire and invigorated it. And certainly reports on the ground and reports post-fire uh, show that around that time there was this um, invigoration of the fire. So just a couple of things, and this is um, related to modelling these events and how to predict these events, right? These are, we've got these great models available to us. 
Um, and, and these are really the state of the art and the future of numerical weather prediction. But everything is not perfect in these models. So here's our simulation that I've just showed you. This was using an older version of the Access or the Unified model, version 7.5. Um, the new version showed quite different role structures, which were, were not as role-like, but much more cellular, which actually arguably, arguably look much more closer to the observations um, in the newer version of the model. And at the current operational weather prediction resolutions, one and a half kilometres, you see that these roles are really quite coherent. So these aren't numerical artefacts, but they, they are strongly controlled by the numerical representation in your model and the resolution of the model. And uh, Will Thurston also wrote a paper on this. Now this is a problem we've known about actually for, for quite, a, quite some time, probably 25, 30 years since we've been running one kilometre resolution models for research purposes. What about the bore? The angular bore. Turns out angular bores are quite common in Australia. Um, they're, they're very famous in northern Australia, but whenever a front moves through southern Australia, quite, quite often we get a pressure, pressure jump ahead of that front, and quite often that pressure jump is consistent with a, a nocturnal bore. Now, this is nothing to do with a fire day. This is just a, another um, research project we're doing when we're looking at uh, precipitation events, but we're looking at an event that generated an angular bore. And we ran an ensemble of simulations, 30 ensemble members, uh, to see how frequently or how predictable that angular bore was. Turned out that in every member of our numerical model ensemble, we got an angular bore. Right? So actually the occurrence of the angular bore was quite predictable, but these are the locations of all of our angular bores at the same time from our 30 different ensemble members. So there's quite a lot of spread in the location of those bores. Now this is consistent with what we see and what we've heard about today about the, um, the passage of the cool change. We knew there was going to be a cool change on Black Saturday. But the timing of that cool change was critically important, but there was uncertainty associated with that timing, which is equivalent to uncertainty in the location. Same with bores. I think that the occurrence of these bores are predictable, but there is going to be this uncertainty in timing and location. So to summarise, um, we've been using high resolution model simulations to try and understand the processes going on on the day of Black Saturday um, to identify what the key mesoscale and small scale atmospheric phenomena are that affect fire danger or fires on the day. Uh, we saw these boundary layer roles that modulate the fire danger with actually the largest influence from the winds and we saw this nocturnal bore that formed with the passage of the synoptic front and it interacted with the Beechworth fire. Uh, both of these small scale features do uh, pose a real challenge to high resolution numerical weather prediction and um, I think it's a, an interesting and useful research problem for the future. So, thanks.